who don't know me, I'm Russ Rogerson. I'm the president and CEO of the, of the Morgantown Area Partnership. And throughout uh, this past year, we've been pleased to be able to bring these virtual learning labs uh, on various subjects throughout the year, hopefully current pertinent subjects. Um, and just so everybody knows, um, we are going to record this uh, presentation. We will be placing it on our website. Uh, so that if uh, you find great value in this uh, and want to look at it again, or if you talk to other people uh, who ha didn't have an opportunity, please let them know that this will be posted on the partnership website. So um, what we'll do is we're going to get things started uh, by turning it over to our presenter today, Mr. Mark Mangano. Uh, he's uh, presented before for us, and uh, I think he's pretty well known throughout the community, but we're pleased to have him here today to really talk about an update on current options for small businesses and nonprofits as it relates to the PPP program. So uh, he's uh, been following this uh, extensively. Um, Mark's uh, done many things in the nonprofit world as well as with small business. And he's one of our uh, resident experts that, that we love to bring on and, and, and help you all understand just what the heck's going on out there. The world's crazy and a lot of information flying around. So. So we're, we're pleased to have Mark to kind of boil it down and make sense for us and, and be that resource and asset. So Mark, we very much appreciate you being here today. We're gonna to hand it off to Mark. And then if you have questions throughout the, uh, uh, the, the, the conversation, appreciate if you would post them on chat and then we'll make sure we get them uh, to in front of Mark uh, for answering. And I'm sure he'll share his contact information at the end so that if you wanna reach out you know, and talk something specific to you as an organization or an individual, he's more than willing to, to take those on. So with that, we'll turn this over to Mark and uh, begin our presentation. All right, thanks, Russ. Well, I'm gonna pop up uh, a uh, slideshow here because nothing's fun without a slideshow. And uh, let's see, let me share that. And can everybody see, the, see that? Okay, and I am probably gonna we got here. All right. So again, I'm Mark Mangano. Uh, I'm going to probably just pull this off here. Okay. Uh, and uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the Paycheck Protection Program and the current options for small businesses and nonprofits. Since you've joined me this morning, I assume that you have not previously applied for a PPP loan or are considering application for a second draw loan or an increase on your first PPP loan. Uh, we're gonna discuss PPP at a pretty high level because we could easily jump down a rabbit hole on any one of a dozen aspects of PPP. But I will point out at the end, excellent resources where you can get very detailed, plain English guidance on issues that are specifically applicable to you and your situation. First, let's talk about the bad news. The current PPP authorization is winding to a close. Applications must be processed by the SBA by March 31st, 2021. As a practical matter, applications must be submitted to lenders well in advance of the deadline to ensure approval. I see we've got some bankers on the, on the uh, call here today. Uh, it leaves really very little time to successfully submit an application this month if you're not already prepared. Uh, however, I don't think everything is lost. Uh, there, I think there's significant reason for optimism that the program may be further extended, but I think the extension may be very short-lived. Understanding the program and being prepared to apply quickly may be critical to taking advantage of the program benefits. Uh, we'll discuss the development of the PPP and put in perspective that this is not your grandfather's PPP. The program continues to undergo significant changes even as the time runs out on the current funding. So if you previously determined that you did not qualify or that it did not make sense, I encourage you to look again. So, so first let's talk about a little bit of history and approach and resources. Why is this different from what it was before? Let's face it, the Paycheck Protection Program is an enormous undertaking that was created on the fly to address an immediate crisis. Upon reflection by lawmakers, administrators, and businesses, it was soon, 
realized that it needed to go through a continuous transformation. Fortunately, for smaller businesses, nearly all of the changes have been geared to make the program more accessible, expand eligibility, increase forgiveness, and embrace the wide variety of small business issues. Today, we will explore where the PPP rules come from, how they've changed, and where to get answers to your specific questions. So first off, PPP began as a tool to keep people on payrolls. When it began, it was a short-term solution to keep people in place. In March of last year, we thought that uh, there was a lot of op op optimism that this was going to be a really bad economic jolt, that it was going to be severe but temporary. As it turned out, that wasn't the case. It was a lot worse than we thought it was going to be, and it lasted longer. But initially, PPP was just a measure to keep everybody in place. In addition, with time, policymakers were able to evaluate the shortcomings of the choices made in, the, in that time of crisis. The early program was complex and it was highly technical. There were initially very little guidance for individuals and very small businesses, and it emphasized very restrictive definitions of forgivable expenditures. And it was, there was a lot of worry about whether you were going to get forgiveness and how, how hard they were going to uh, do this. We've all seen government programs where they give with one hand and later on say, eh, we didn't really want you to keep the money. <laughs> I think that's not, I think that's turned out to be a different case now. I think it evolved. As the economic crisis wore on, Congress began to change its approach and directed the Treasury Department and the Small Business Administration, the SBA, to do the same. The emphasis broadened from maintaining employee counts to helping businesses survive to employ people later. The rules that were basically rewritten uh, from the original program. Uh, some of the notable things that, they, that, that happened were that we lowered the percentage of proceeds that must be spent on wages. We allowed more spending on non-payroll expenses. They softened forgiveness reductions for workforce reductions. They increased the time period for spending proceeds on wages. They expanded the eligibility definitions. They expanded the authorized expense definitions. And they increased forgiveness rules to include idle advances. And idle is the economic entry uh, 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 disaster loans. And for a lot of people early on, uh, they may have gotten five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten thousand dollars in a grant that was rolled into their PPP loan when they got forgiveness. They were asked to, to repay that. Those have been forgiven, and uh, SBA has been mailing out checks to get rid of those. Uh, we really moved from restrictive to expansive. There have been measures that have been taken to restrict the access to the program in the, over the year, but they have really related to larger businesses. Initially, you know, this was a pretty restrictive program. It was just small businesses and 501c3s and 501c19 veterans groups, as well as uh, tribal organizations. Uh, now we have a range of eligible nonprofit entities, groups and individuals that can, and it continues to expand. With the most recent law enacted uh, on March 11th of this year, the types of nonprofits eligible for the program has expanded to include not only 501c3, 4, 6, and 19 organizations previously authorized, but include a broad definition of tax exempt nonprofits subject to certain limitations. Uh, that's a very general description because that's what's in the, the most recent act. Uh, we're going to need to wait for rules to tell us exactly how that's going to be implemented and, and what nonprofit, what additional nonprofits are going to be able to access this program. Uh, so again, we're just about to finish this program on March 31st, but Congress is still writing new rules and expanding, potentially expanding the access. So getting some mixed messages here. Uh, We've also uh, you know, it just recently uh, expanded to include alternative ways to calculate loan amounts. Uh, most notably, uh, they, they created new ways to calculate if you're an individual sole proprietor uh, who files a form uh, 1040, a Schedule C, and, or an a individual farmer who is filing a Schedule F. And they also uh, expanded it to allow partnerships 
uh, that previously were not allowed to include partner compensation in their calculations to now include that in their amount. Uh, one of the other neat things is that they also, uh, they also repealed the prohibition on getting multiple draws on a PPP loan. So there are borrowers who could benefit from the change of rules and they're now able to access that. I wanna make sure I've had something happen on my computer here. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I, for some reason, pictures went away and I just wanted to make sure I was, we were still there. So <laughs> talking to myself. Uh, again, so those partnerships that, that now can go back and recalculate their loan and get more can actually go back and reapply uh, for an increase in their loan. We also, the, Congress also did away with some, some kind of ugly restrictions. Uh, if, an owner, uh, you, if an owner was delinquent or defaulted on student loan debt, they raced out of the program. Uh, if you had committed a felony uh, that was you're still not allowed to get a PPP loan if one of your owners uh, has uh, a, a fraud felony, uh, financial fraud felony. But for just garden variety felonies, uh, that is no longer a, a, a strike against you with eligibility. Uh, now, given all those things I just talked about, we've increased the complexity of the program. Uh, you know, the moves from the, just this short-term, relatively technical, simple fix that didn't, didn't identify a lot of needs uh, to one that modifies all the general rules to make it more beneficial to more uh, small businesses has paradoxically uh, been a situation where the, the, the law got more complicated and has more features to it. But for the most part, it has eased the process of obtaining a loan and getting it forgiven. And fortunately, as this, this law has and program has matured, they have, the, the resources have gotten better. So we'll talk about this later, but where do you go to get help for your specific issues? Probably the best place uh, are the banks, credit unions, and other financial institutions that have chosen to participate in this program. And that I want to give a shout out to, to them. Uh, they, they should get a lot of credit for what they're doing. Uh, they, they get mixed, mixed reviews in the media. But truly, they have done, this is, I think, this crisis in the PPP has been banks and credit unions and financial institutions, institutions shining hour. They stepped up to the plate in, a, in an absolute rush uh, and got it right uh, and got a lot of uh, over $670 billion lent on, on a program that didn't exist at the beginning of last year. Uh, and so they are a great resource. They have seen, probably seen it all at this stage of the game. The second, and second important place to go is to the SBA and Treasury websites uh, where they have posted the rules, the guidance, uh, and frequently asked questions. And we'll talk about those later. Uh, and the third place I go for information, aside from webinars like this, uh, which is an excellent one, uh, is the internet. But I give you a caution on that. Uh, right now in, in this program, getting information from the internet is a bit hazardous, not because people are out there writing articles or putting out information that was patently wrong when they did it, but because the, the, the game continues to change. And so uh, you could read something uh, that, that somebody posted as, as, as early as, la as late as last week, and it could now be wrong. So, uh, you know, take, be, I think it's good to get some general idea with the internet, but you really want to go back to the banks, uh, financial institutions, and the horse's mouth, the SBA and the treasury uh, to ensure you're getting the right information. Okay. Uh, again, as we've been talking about, the PPP continues to evolve, even as it's closing, closing down. So I'm going to give you a little history of how we got where we are. Uh, you know, this started off with the CARES Act back way back, almost a year ago, March 27th, 2020. Uh, and it, this was a, a, a special program added to the SBA 7A program, uh, but it's its own animal. 
but the SBA administers it. Then shortly thereafter, because it was so popular and, and they needed more money allocated, uh, Congress enacted the Paycheck Protection Health Care Enhancement Act and added some funding, but didn't really change anything about the program. Big changes came with the Paycheck Protection Flexibility Act. And this is where you see Congress starting to, it's starting to dawn on them that this needs to be a kinder, friendlier program and really start to reach out to smaller businesses. Uh, and that the big big changes there, uh, they went from an eight week period, uh, we call it a covered period, uh, when you needed to spend your funds. Uh, and if you didn't spend them all within that eight week period, you, you didn't get full forgiveness. Well, as it turns out, that eight week period wasn't really enough time to spend the money. Uh, so they really liberalized that. They went, they extended it to potentially a 24 week period. Uh, and made it a lot easier to make sure you spent all the money on the, the appropriate things and get full forgiveness of your loan. Uh, it extended the program. The original CARES Act only went through June 30th. Again, we thought it was going to be a short issue. Uh, extended it through the end of 2020. It also changed the required expenditure proceeds, uh, expenditure of proceeds on payroll from 75% Again, we need you to spend this all on payroll. We want to keep everybody in place. We don't want them on unemployment. They changed that to 60%. So we're starting to see just from a formula standpoint, a rec dawning recognition that it's not only enough that we try to keep people on payrolls, we need to think about sur you know, the survivability of small businesses and ensuring that we have a robust small business sector when we come out the other side of this crisis. Uh, they also extended the minimum payment term from two years to five years, and they agreed that all payments should be deferred, uh, which helped everybody. Uh, that's a lot less administration. Uh, it's a lot less worry for cash, cash flow for businesses that are already under, under strain. Uh, so really pretty thoughtful changes uh, in, in June. So we're good. We're rolling through the, you know, we're authorized through the end of the year. And, and again, COVID uh, pandemic is still wearing on everybody, and there's a recognition that we need to do more. Uh, and so the Economic Aid to Hard Hit and Small Businesses and Nonprofits and Venues Act uh, was implemented in uh, December 20, on December 27th of last year, and it did some really cool stuff, a lot of stuff uh, to expand this program. Uh, first, it, uh, the biggest thing is it created the second draw program. We'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but it also expanded eligibility. You know, again, previously it started out, you, you, your nonprofits were pretty much limited to 501c3s uh, and 19s. Well, it added 501c6 organizations, which are uh, things like uh, Morgantown Area Partnership, uh, excluded uh, sports leagues and campaign and lobbying groups from that, uh, that group, uh, but really did some, you know, really expanded the program. It added cooperative housing corporations and destination marketing organizations. It added, it defined seasonal employees and employers in a way that made it possible for them to get real relief from this program. Uh, it eliminated uh, publicly traded businesses, uh, declared them ineligible. And I think we saw that as the backlash from the original program. We're all familiar with the very public uh, uh, land basing that Ruth Chris Steakhouse took uh, and they gave the money back. Uh, and that idea, you know, the, the narrative that uh, a lot of fat cats were taking advantage of the business, uh, the, the PPP and crowding out small businesses. Uh, and those, and it all, but also, you know, as it, as it uh, created the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant uh, Program, it indicated that you couldn't have both. And this, and we'll talk about that a little later, but basically they're just trying to create a situation where we don't have double dippers or triple dippers where you're getting three grants, three forgivable uh, grants from the, uh, the US government uh, for the same expenses. So you shouldn't be able to make money on these programs. They should, you should be able to pick and choose, but only get it, get it paid once. Uh, there are a number of other things, you know, that, that was the Economic Aid and Hard Hit Businesses uh, Nonprofits and Venues Act uh, was a real watershed for the PPP. <clears throat> uh, it increased the ability to request uh, an increase to a PPP loan. So for certain barter, borrowers that obtained a PPP loan uh, in 2020, they may be able to increase it. Uh, 
that includes partnerships that you know didn't include partnership compensation. Uh, it also includes the seasonal employers uh, that under the new rules can, can choose to pick any 12 week period to determine that, and this is between February uh, 19 and February 2020, to determine what their, their monthly, average monthly payroll should be. And that, that is a potentially significant increase in their availability or access to PPP funding. Uh, they also made it so, uh, agreed that borrowers who had returned part of their PPP loan because again, early in the CARES Act, there were a lot of people worried about whether they were gonna get called on the carpet. And so they gave some of the money back. Uh, it, they can go back and apply to get the rest of their funding. Uh, borrowers that, uh, that received, uh, that, that didn't accept the full amount, uh, sometimes they didn't give it back, but they were approved for more, but didn't take it all. They can go back and get the rest of it. They also, the, the, the act also expanded the kinds of expenses, the non-payroll expenses you could get covered. So it's a lot easier to, especially in a situation where your expenses changed because of COVID, uh, they, they expanded the list of covered expenditures. So they look at, they, for operation expenditures, you can spend it on business software, cloud computing, product or service delivery, processing, payment, tracking, payroll expenses, human resources, sales, billing functions, accounting, just about everything you do in your business. So it's not a restrictive list anymore. Uh, you can get paid for da property damages costs. Fortunately, we did not have a lot of civil unrest in West Virginia, but if you had that uh, damage from that, you could get uh, add that into your, your forgivable expenses. Uh, co covered supplier costs. So if you're paying, uh, for suppliers that, that previously, if you were, uh, you couldn't deduct those things or you couldn't add, use those to get forgiveness on your PPP loan. Uh, we also expenditures on worker protection. So sneeze guards and additional entry points and uh, services to, to keep, it, keep your, your facilities clean and safe. Those were also expenses that are added. Um, we also did some neat things to make it easier to get forgiveness for very small businesses. Uh, they created a safe harbor uh, for, for borrowers under $150,000. Uh, and you could ensure that you don't have, you're, you're not number one, not gonna probably be re reviewed by the SBA. Uh, but if you, if you were able to bring your FTE numbers back up, say you had a certain FTE at the beginning of, uh, in that period between February 15th and April, uh, April 26th of 2020, uh, and your numbers went down, but you brought them up by the end of your covered period, that 24 week period, uh, it was no harm, no foul. Uh, you, you didn't have that much payroll during the time, but you don't get a reduction because you didn't have enough people on board. Uh, and we're going to assume that uh, it, it for smaller loans, uh, we're going to assume that you made a good faith statement that you needed the loan. So the SBA is going to be looking at loans over $150,000 specifically with respect to a certification that the loan was necessary because of the uncertainty. Uh, they're not really going to look very closely at that on loans under $150,000. Uh, they created a they're, created a simpler forgiveness application. Uh, if you're under $150,000, all you need to do is describe the number of employees, estimate the total amount of, uh, of the loan spent on payroll costs and the total loan value. And uh, you don't have to create, you don't have to bring in a whole lot of records with you. Uh, now you do have to have the records to back it up and you need to keep them for a four year period. And as we mentioned, the idle, idle deduction, so those get paid off. And, and a really important thing is uh, tax implications. Uh, you know, under the CARES Act, PPP loans will not be included as taxable income, even if forgiven. But previously, the IRS said you can't deduct the expenses. So it was giving with one hand and taking away with another. Well, the Relief Act uh, provided that expenses paid 
with proceeds of a forgiven PPP loan are deductible and overrode the IRS guidance. So the most recent law enacted is the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021. And that came into being on March 11th of this year. Uh, that, that created another, that added another seven and a half billion dollars in funding, uh, expanded eligibility for tax exempt nonprofits. Uh, and we're gonna need to wait and see what the rules say about who's in and who's out on that. Uh, and then I think we need to, to keep in mind that as of last week, uh, there was uh, authorized for this program $813 billion, of which $687 billion has been put out. So we've got over $100 billion left in the PPP program uh, to be spent and probably will not get spent by March 31st. Uh, another reason why we probably will see some additional legislation is that there's a big backlog of loans with the SBA. Uh, they've been trying to wade their way through, uh, especially for second draw loans. Uh, when, when they're reviewing a loan, uh, that can hold up a second draw approval. And we need to, they, they need to clear that, and we're not sure exactly how that's going to happen. Uh, so I think that there, there are a lot of reasons why we may see something else. And I think there's a, there's a real push to, to continue to get stimulus into the economy. There is uh, talk of a bill, there's a bill circulating in Congress called the Payroll Protection Program Expen Expansion Act of 2021. Uh, and that suggested legislation would extend the program to May 31st, again, not a terribly long time. And, and as these things go, it may take time for it to get through Congress. Uh, so the window may not be terribly long by the time it actually you know, comes into being. But the idea is that we, we extend the program to May 31st and then also have another 30 days of the program being active so that the SBA can clean up any backlog of, of applied for loans. So I think it's helpful as, as for a small business when you're trying to figure out uh, what's going on uh, to, to look at you know, what where does this come from? You know, how do I know what to look for? What am I looking at? And most of us don't have to deal with uh, how, how things are made, but I think it's important in this case to have a little understanding of that. Uh, so first off, it's legislation. Congress enacts a bill, the president signs it, it becomes law. Uh, what the, the act of Congress signed into law does is it provides the authority for and limitations on the government's actions. The next stage is rulemaking. Laws, you know, federal laws especially, are carried out by government agencies. But government agencies have to tell us how they're going to do it. In this case, it's the US Treasury and the SBA. Uh, the agencies must interpret the legislation and set forth the detailed description of how the intent of Congress will be carried out. Normally, they publish proposed rules and gather comments before issuing a final rule. In the case of PPP, there just isn't time. So the agencies have been issuing what we call interim final rules that gather comments later. And sometimes those show up as revised interim final rules or additional final rules that modify the previous final rules. Uh, a little confusing nomenclature. Uh, the SEBA and the Treasury have issued over 30 of these interim final rules on the PPP. Fortunately, they've made some great efforts uh, late in the game to ensure that you don't need to go back and look up all of the old interim final rules to understand and participate in the program. Uh, we also have guidance and interpretations. Uh, in addition to the rules, which can be a bit long-winded and difficult to navigate, the agencies publish how-to guides, summaries, webinars, articles. These tend to address common questions in less technical fashion. And finally, procedures. And again, this is one of the best places for you to understand the program and what you can get from it. And the, the agencies communicate through rule, the rules of the program through well-written and logical applications, forms, instructions, and procedural memos. SBA got a lot of grief early on and probably justifiably so because some things didn't always, didn't clearly match up. There wasn't a lot of background, but I think that as the program has matured, 
they have caught up to it. Uh, and that now if you read an application either for a, a loan or for forgiveness, it really walks you through pretty well. Uh, so there's, and, and if you have additional questions, you can, you can go to a frequently asked question document and get a more detailed answer. So let's see what we got here. Okay. And so where are we now? What's the current structure of what, what's available to, to, to potential borrowers now? First off, let's remember all PPP loans are provided through banks, credit unions, or other financial institutions. Remember the idle loans, the shuttered, shuttered venue and restaurants and, and, the, and the new newly enacted uh, restaurant grant uh, programs are gonna be administered by the SBA directly. Uh, first draw loans. First draw loans are what we've been doing all of 2020, uh, just reauthorized. Uh, these are, uh, you know, pretty, you have pretty big limits, 10 and $20 million. We aren't gonna see too many of those going out at this stage of the game. Uh, but you, again, still, if you have not gotten a PPP loan, it's still out there, still available to you uh, and highly recommend you look at it. And what we have now is second draw loans. And those are, are tremendous. Uh, this, is a, these, this program is really targeted at smaller businesses and nonprofits. Uh, one of the keys to this is, you know, you have to show that you were actually, that you, it wasn't a theoretical injury or uncertainty, you actually had a, a diminution in your revenues as a result of it. So you have to show that you had at least a 25% reduction in gross receipts uh, as a result of, of COVID. And the limits on these loans are much smaller. It's $2 million. So these are not gonna be going out to large corporations. Uh, they're gonna be much, uh, much more targeted. So some comp, and, and then the other part of the structure is, you know, the two lo loans you can get in, uh, and then you have forgiveness. And the forgiveness process we'll talk about in a little, uh, little while here. Um, and, and it, is, it is pretty much the same for both first draw and second draw loans. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we try to, I'm trying to make it, give you some simple things. Uh, you know, what are the general terms? But as I mentioned, because they've tried to make this reach out to people with very specific needs, it's a little more complicated than that. But we'll talk about some general common features of first and second draw loans. First is authorized use of funds. The loans can be used to help fund payroll costs, including benefits, and may also be used to pay for mortgage interest, rent, utilities, worker pro protection costs related to COVID-19, uninsured property damages you know, related to looting, and certain supplier uh, costs and expenses of operations. The loan terms. You know, what is it when you get a PPP loan? The loans have an interest rate of 1%. They have a maturity of five years. Uh, loan payments are deferred for borrowers who apply for forgiveness until the SBA remits the borrower's loan forgiveness amount to the lender. If you don't apply, uh, you can't just have it uh, deferred forever. Uh, if you don't apply, they're going to start the clock on you at the end of your 24-week uh, covered period and add 10 months to that. At that point, at the end of that period, you'll need to start making payments. Um, you don't have to make any collateral or personal guarantees. And that's a real benefit relative to the idle loans where they really are looking for uh, guarantees and collateral and those types of things. Uh, you know, these, these are, you know, this is a, this is a sign, your, sign your name sort of thing on behalf of the business. Uh, neither the government, you know, importantly, neither the government nor lenders will charge any fees to, to get a PPP loan. Uh, uh, for forgiveness. Again, we can use up to 24 weeks to amass the numbers we need to get full forgiveness. Remember, we need to spend the money we get from the PPP loan on approved expenses. Uh, again, the uh, couple of things that can reduce uh, your, your, your forgiveness are if your compensation levels aren't maintained within a percentage of, of the original pay that you had before the crisis. Uh, the number of FTEs have declined, that could decline, uh, lead to a decline in your forgiveness. 
Uh, and then you know, just have to make sure that you're spending it on the eligible expenses and at least 60% of the proceeds are spent on payroll costs. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about eligibility. Um, just about every, you know, it, it doesn't matter how you're organized, you're eligible for this. Uh, so if, it's, if you're a sole proprietor or independent contractor or self-employed person, you, you are eligible unless you have one of the uh, a reason why you shouldn't be in. And we'll talk about those in a little while. Uh, early on, this was just about small business concerns that met the SBA size standards or 500 people. Uh, 500, 500 employees. Now for second draw loans, that is only 300. So you can't, this is, we're getting, we're gonna focus second draw on smaller businesses. Uh, we, again, we broadened, you know, broadened this as we mentioned before uh, to include a lot more nonprofits. Uh, and we've uh, extended the, let's see, bear with me a second. Uh, We've expanded, again, expanded that category of nonprofits we talked about before in the American Rescue Plan Act. We're gonna still need to wait to see how that's gonna, gonna play out. All right. So eligibility restrictions. So assuming you're of the right uh, type of small business, uh, there are reasons why you might not be able to get a loan. Uh, if you have been barred by the federal government from contracting with the, the government, you're not gonna be able to get a PPP. Uh, they've indicated uh, that they, you know, if you're in bankruptcy, they're not going to approve your loan. Uh, there have been some court cases, and I think that you know there, there are some judges who have said, no, you have to give them the loan, and so we're not. Uh, but the the intent is not to give you a loan if you have, if you are in bankruptcy. Uh, if you are in, delinquent or defaulted on federal debt, this does not include student loans, but any other kind of federal debt, uh, you're going to be foreclosed from applying. And felonies, again, they changed this recently. Uh, previously, it was uh, all felonies uh, within the last year and uh, financially, financial, financial fraud felonies within the last five years. They got rid of the common felonies. So only the only thing that's gonna knock you out is if you, uh, are, you know, have a, a financial fraud felony. And you also have to have your employees residing in the United States. So they don't wanna push any of this money over overseas. So we have to make some certifications. Uh, when, you, when you make these loans, it isn't just sign your name. You have to tell them certain things uh, about, about how you're going to use the money and your status. Uh, one of the new things uh, is that you have to, to, to uh, certify that you were in business on February 15th, 2020. They don't want to be giving out money for businesses started during the COVID-19 and then compensating them for whether it went well or it went, did, it went well or did not go well. Uh, because the reason this is important is that they have expanded uh, the, the timeframes you can compare. Uh, you can now use 2019 to, or 2020 numbers to justify your, your, your average monthly uh, payroll to calculate your loan amount. Uh, you have to, you know, on, on first draw loans, you still have to make that certification that the current uncertainty makes the loan request necessary to support the ongoing operations of the business. Uh, you have to certify you will use the proceeds for the authorized purposes. Uh, you, you really can't, you know, get it for, uh, for maintaining your payroll and running your business and then run off and get yourself a Lamborghini. Uh, some people have done that, it has been frowned upon. Uh, by the government, uh, and you and you also uh, that you won't get a shuttered venue operators grant. Uh, again, this is don't double dip. Uh, again, you can have had a PPP loan before, but going forward, you can't get a PPP loan for the same period you're getting a, a, a shuttered venue grant, and you also can't be. Uh, an issuer of securities or high ranking federal official or congressman uh, or a, a agency head uh, and get one of these loans. We, there, was a, there was a lot of unpleasantness over some senators who got PPP funding for some businesses they had. 
Now let's talk a little bit about the second draw limitations. Again, we talked about them before. You have to have had a growth uh, reduction in gross receipts. Uh, again, more restrictive size limits and lower maximum uh, loan limits. Again, when it's size limits, you can't be as large a business and still qualify as you could before and the first draws. Forgiveness. This is the, the process is has become a lot easier to understand than it was at the beginning of the program. And certainly for people with really small loans, they've made it super simple. It only requires that you certify uh, you know, a, cert, a, few, a few questions and you require that uh, submission, uh, but it doesn't require that you submit documents, and, but you do have to maintain them for four years. SBA review, uh, they're gonna review everything over $150,000 for whatever purpose they want to. And they can review things under 150, 150, but they've not indicated they're going to do that. Uh, but you need to keep your documents for six years uh, just in case something comes up. And they're going to presume that your certification, that very important certification on first draw loans that, that uncertainty made the loan necessary, they're just gonna assume that you're right. Everybody over $150,000, they're gonna look at it. And if you, if you did, were doing just fine and, and they have some reason to believe that that was not a good faith certification, they can deny your forgiveness application or declare you ineligible. Uh, the process for forgiveness, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, there is an application you download, uh, you get your documentation together if you're of that size. You take it to your lender. The lender reviews the application for forgive, uh, for completeness and makes a determination whether you've given them enough information to recommend that uh, recommend forgiveness. They then forward that information and their recommendation onto the SBA. Uh, we talked about when you have to apply, but uh, the lender then has you know, once you make the application, the lender has 60 days to review. Uh, the SBA has 90 days to render a decision. And until the SBA renders, renders a decision of either they're going to forgive and sends the money to the bank to pay off your loan, or that they're not going to, you don't have to make any payments. So that's kind of the overview. And, and, and now, you know, as, you, as you go forth and try to figure out how to make use of this and how to go get a loan, I want to point you to some 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 resources that can help get there quickly. Uh, first is getting answers on a first drop. First question people have is where do I find a lender? You know, maybe I don't have a bank, you know, especially at this stage of the game. Borrowers who have not uh, gotten a, a first uh, draw PPP loan very often are, uh, from what we're hearing in the media and from SBA studies, are, are borrowers who may not have established borrowing relationships with a bank. Uh, so a place to start, if, not, if, you, if you don't get a referral from your friends, uh, is to go out to the SBA site and they have a link that says find a lender and you put your, your location in and they'll tell you who in your area is participating in the program. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of the best places to go get information is, is uh, the forms. So you can go and click and look up the application, your kind of application form, and it'll give you the instructions. And also calculating a loan. Uh, you, they, they have a walkthrough of every type of loan calculation available. Uh, so again, it's different for a sole proprietor than it is for a C Corp uh, or for a partnership. They'll walk you through examples and make it easy. Uh, Next is uh, you know, the frequently asked questions. They update this continuously uh, and it is really a question and answer sort of thing. So you look for your question and see your, your, the response and they try, have really tried to make these things plain English. Uh, getting answer on, on second draw. Uh, again, look, first place I would go is look at the applications and see if it, if it matches you. And also you have a, a calculator, a, a document that'll tell you how to calculate. And finally, if you really want to get to the, to the source documents, uh, while I told you there were over 30 interim final rules published, there are really four that you need to, 
to pay attention to at this stage of the game. These, uh, they tried to summarize everything at the end of, when the Economic Aid Act came out in December. Uh, and so you have an interim final rule, the overall rules, and then uh, second draw loans, loan forgiveness uh, rules, and calculation eligibility. As I mentioned, I gave you a link here to, to put a nice little graph on how to understand uh, what you can have at the same time. So how do PPP loans relate to uh, idle loans and uh, the uh, shuttered venue uh, grants? And kind of like a, the old saying, you know, where one door closes, maybe a window opens. I think that may be the case here. You know, again, we have $100 billion left. There's a strong push to put stimulus into the economy. There's a great desire to restart the economy, and we're seeing that optimism with vaccinations. So watch for legislation, see if the PPP Extension Act comes, comes about. Uh, and if it does, be ready to apply and get in the queue because there may not be a lot of time. And I'm going to commend to you some other resources. I really, uh, first one on here is the Jackson Kelly website. Uh, we, uh, the firm is populated with a bunch of wonderfully talented lawyers who are writing about a, a wide variety of business issues. Uh, and we think you know, there, there's a lot of great insight, as it says, insights and blog. Uh, and so I, I commend you to go take a look there uh, and go. you can sign up very easily. Uh, not much pain to get emails of uh, when we post new blogs, but you can go check it if you want to. Uh, but you know, again, we'll push them out to you if you, if you, if you request it. Uh, and then these are the, the, the central locations to go access the US Treasury and SBA on their PPP stuff. So it'll save you some time hunting and pecking around on your computer. Uh, you know, thanks so much for listening. I wanna wish you the very best in emerging from the crisis and taking advantage of this truly wonderful program. Uh, that concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, Mark. Uh, appreciate that. And uh, as just sitting through the presentation, you can realize why we have so many people on this call because <laughs> there's a there's a lot there. But I uh, uh, and, and I think you did a great job of breaking it down and, and definitely on the resource. Uh, we'll share this presentation if you're uh, okay with that with uh, all the attendees and. So you didn't have to jot down all those, uh, those yeah. links uh, at the same time, right? And I talked to Amy early about uh, you know uh, sending these, this, sharing the slide deck with people directly by email. But if, if you have any trouble there, if you want to shoot my, again, my contact information is up there, mark.mangano at jacksonkelly.com. Uh, if you want a copy of the slide deck, so you can just click the links as opposed to <laughs> writing all that stuff down. <laughs> Uh, be delighted. That was the point. Uh, is yeah. It should be easy for you to get there. Yeah, so we'll make sure we, we get that. And you'll see there's a note on there uh, um, that all registrants will receive a copy. And and uh, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to Mark directly as well. Um, Mark, we did get one question. Okay. Um, the question is, uh, did the requirement of showing 25% loss between 2019 and 2020 to apply get changed or dropped? As a nonprofit, we were able to get first round PPP, but this requirement on the second round has kept us from eligibility. Yeah, the second draw requirement still is there of a 25% gross receipts drop. Uh, and I feel your pain. Uh, we, I, I'm, I'm treasurer of a, of a nonprofit and, and you know, fortunately, we came in just under the wire, but there was a panic drill uh, when we went to go get our second draw because three months ago, we, we had a doomsday clock going, uh, determining how many months we had left before we ran out of cash. And because we got some grants and different things come in, some government assistance, it almost blew it up. So, but we wind up just barely getting it. But so no, the 25% requirement still exists for a uh, reduction in receipts for a second draw. Well, come on, we're going to have another question. We want to end up on good news. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's that's just it, right? So when they stack them like that, uh, it does become somewhat of a challenge to show that loss. Well, the good news is that uh, that that they're they're that they're in this time of amazing uncertainty and crisis. There were people out there willing to fund. Uh, and the government was willing to help fund uh, 
nonprofits. You, I, and, and I think there was a real worry at the beginning of this. Uh, you know, would do, would nonprofits be valued in our society? Uh, and I think there's an overwhelming recognition that yeah, we need. As you can see, they're still at, they're they're continuing to expand that definition at the end of the program because. Uh, I think government understands that there is a real need for that to, to make our society function. Absolutely. Maybe, maybe a little late in the game coming to it, but nevertheless, they're getting there. Well, it is government. They're a little slow, but hopefully they eventually catch on, right? We hope so. <laughs> Any other questions for Mark? All right. Well, we appreciate everybody joining us today, and we absolutely appreciate Mark and and uh, your presentation here, but also what you do on a, on a regular basis for our community. And, and uh, so hopefully uh, we'll get this information out to uh, everyone later today. And again, don't hesitate to reach out uh, to Mark for specific questions. Uh, with that, we're gonna close this session. And once again, thank everyone for attending and have a great day. Thank you so much. Yeah. Take care.